Do, do you make a distinction between art intended for uh, art spaces and art intended for public spaces? Yeah, I think there's a difference between pieces that are in museums and galleries and institutions that have a um, morality and a knowledge of who the audience is and ones that um, are without uh, any ideological overtone that doesn't point back to the art world. Although I think it's probably impossible to get away from uh, a frame completely, there are some sites which I prefer that aren't either what you would characterize as public or private in that they're just leftover sites. I think one of the problems you have with most public sculpture in America right now is that it's um, co-opted by the buildings that it's put in front of. So you have a condition where you have a lot of bobbles on 6th Avenue, and they uh, purport to be sculpture, but they're absolutely undercut because they fall within the uh, omnificence of IBM or Xerox or whatever, and uh, any seriousness they might have had is completely consumed by uh, the power of the corporate interests. So they become uh, corporate icons, in the same way that a lot of paintings become corporate emblems once they're housed in banks or put up for uh, the middle class to aspire to. I think one of the problems with building pieces in place, if there's no possibility for secondary sale, you don't enter into the market. So there has to be a different emotional commitment from the people who support the work than there is from people who support both the gallery scenes, the magazine scene, the media scene, the um, what you'd say the formal gallery museum scene in America has pretty much been in collusion with trustees and collectors who have a profit motive in mind. And that's very different than putting pieces in public space where secondary sale or um, accruement can't be possible. I just saw a Rodin show at what's called the Cantor Foundation 10 minutes ago. Uh, which are all done, mo um, cast done posthumously after he was dead, and they're absolutely horrendous. And that kind of notion of uh, gross consumerism of uh, products which are completely divorced of the spirit of their origin uh, completely not only undermines the original work, but undermines the uh, notion of commerce because they're really buying uh, overblown nouveau riche baubles after the seventh cast of a Rodin. So there's a lot that goes on in this whole... Oh, so when, when, you, when you make a piece uh, for a public space, do you conceive of it different than the pieces you make for the galleries? I, what I've been trying to do since about 1970 is make pieces that are really site-specific, which means that I take the cues from the space, but I don't try to augment the space or decorate the space or garnish the space or put a new zip tone on the space. What I try to do is redefine the space, not re-represent the space. And what I mean by redefine the space is turn the space into one of a sculptural concern. Often what happens is that's different than the original intention of the space. And when you start changing people's descriptions of spaces, namely, you know, decorative plazas into sculptural concerns, people get very nervous because they don't want their descriptions tampered with. It's got to the degree right now where if I had said five years ago what's going to happen is that you're going to have a new equestrian rider being put up on a um, stand, on a pedestal, one would say, oh no, that's passe. Well, I was just in Frankfurt, in front of the opera house that just went up in uh, stainless steel, a new equestrian rider. That notion of uh, casting in bronze to make something in plaster, to make a mold and then cast it in bronze, to make a hollow figure, is very, very prevalent now. And what you find is that this century is uh, reiterating its first 20 years under the guise of sticking two words together which are one of those um, anoxisms, to put radical and eclecticism together, to me seems like the most um, shabby kind of uh, conceptual thinking that I've heard in maybe the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it's dominating not only painting and sculpture and architecture and music, but it's pervading um, the middle class in that they can reinforce their meager knowledge of what art is by saying, oh, that it's recognizable. And I find it very, very disheartening. I think that this country is in a total mannerist heyday. And uh, most of the work being done 
is absolutely um, hiding under the guise of humanism while it's uh, cynically mocking those people that service it and support it. And that's just happened probably in the last 10 years. What, what There's a like kind of an abstract amnesia going on, right? You know, well, so what are your sculptural concerns in the tilted art? Uh, just that, sculptural concerns. Well, I mean, how would you define them? I, I mean, what? I don't think, you know, finally it's necessary for me to analyze or explain what sculpture concerns are. I don't think there's any audience for sculpture in this country. I don't think there ever has been. I think there's an audience for media, and I think there is a um, consumption of media. And I think people categorize and uh, assume that they know everything about anything, given what Ted Koppel sends them to bed with. And they're all authorities on yesterday's art and yesterday's art show and last year's sculpture. And when I say that there's no audience for sculpture, I know because I'm devoting my life to making sculpture. For me, it's not some kind of uh, occupation. It's what I am. It's not what I do. It's what I am. And I think for people to come in and ask me what my notions are, I think it's all there to be revealed and to be seen by anyone who has their wit about them to um, understand the history of art and the history of sculpture. To ask someone who has no knowledge of a field what his um, critical criteria would be for judgment to me seems to be asinine, and yet I have people attacking my personality, my reason for living, for following what I think is the most radical extension of my work. And for you to ask me what I'm doing there, I think you can see it. You can figure that one out yourself. I'm making sculpture. Best way I know how. Is the, is the controversy over the tilted art piece, has that been s similar to other controversies? Or, or is In that... In Germany, they used one of the pieces Strauss did, who was with CDU as a political football because the SPD uh, backed the piece. So he put 100,000 posters around saying, this will never happen again. And finally, you know, if you think of the number of starfighters that get buried, or you think of the highways that go up, or you think of the horrendous architecture that's built all over this country, which no one ever murmurs about, and everybody by collusion pays taxes. And if you really want to get into it, why the necessity to attack, attack art when no one attacks uh, cult for sending, selling guns to the cowboys and the Indians? I mean, I find it completely incredible that art is the scapegoat and the alibi for everybody's um, political uptightness in this country. I think art does very well when it's left alone. This country right now is so frightened of the notion of abstract art because it doesn't depict or represent or return a profit. Art for art's sake all of a sudden is being demeaned and ridiculed the same way it was in the 30s. And I think when repression comes in the guise of humanism, when you have architects so cynical that they'll build gold anodized aluminum TV antennas on top of old people's homes as a symbol for the elderly, and when you have sculptors casting uh, bronze figures and steel mills and auto workers and steel mills, that kind of humanistic cynicism is a lot of crap. And all it does is support the uh, larger notion of appealing to a class that says, oh yes, there's human content there. And I find it a little bit um, disgraceful that the pervading mode is greed and survival at any cost. Yeah, this government, let me go on, this government actually at one point asked me to build a piece at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And then they asked me to uh, build uh, two pylons framing the Treasury building. And then they asked me to put flags on top. And then I told them I didn't care whether it was swastikas or eagles or flags. And they told me that I would never get another commission in this country as long as I live. I find the notion of what this con con country consumes as art absolutely reprehensible. And I am an American sculptor, absolutely. And yep. So if you ask me, do I distinguish this way and that way? And what do I think about my work in public spaces? And who does it appeal to? And you start asking me those questions which came down on me very hard for following the course of my work. I think that um, this country really should take a look around and see who its artists are rather than running the stock market on them. And, but you, you believe your work belongs in public spaces? I believe some of it does. And I, 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 work, I really build with sites as the um, origin of the work if I can't. If I can't, I have a desire to work, so I build right out of my studio. But usually, I don't like site-adjusted work as a rule. Usually what I try to do is go to a site and build there. Right now I'm building an entire square block in Barcelona. 
I'm building a piece in uh, La Defense at the end of the Champs Elysees. I'm building a piece in Louisiana. I'm building a piece for the city of Munster. There are some um, cities that absolutely understand what I'm up to and can deal with the content of the work. I found New York and its um, notion of what sculpture is in this decade as a uh, reaction McNary as the galleries which support most of the work. So, mm -hmm. there you go. Okay, wait, I was just, uh, yeah, this, this stuff, yeah. Oh, wait, wait the same, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, can, can you describe the uh, shape of the tilted arc? Listen, I think, you know, you're into asking me about formal um, explications, and if you really want those, go look at the piece. It's not for me to do. I mean, that if I describe the shape, that's not the content of the piece. I mean, if I say tilted arc, I mean, that pretty much carries its load. If you think about what that means, you'll understand what it means. I don't think there are too many things in the world like that. If you haven't seen it, then you have to go dope it out. But I am not going to get into that kind of rundown. I don't think it's useful to me or anyone else. I would rather have people experience the piece in its place because I think it's impossible to have an experience of the place outside of the place you're in. Mm. And I don't think language does it. I think at most language points to it. I have a certain um, notion that language has its own internal dread. Yeah. Actually, if I think about figurative art right now, I think maybe the only worthwhile figurative art is after someone dies, a cadaver looking back at itself seems to me the most accurate representation that we can probably get to, and everything else uh, seems like um, depiction or illustration. Wait, well, formalism or art about uh, art uh, has actually a very short history, and even a short history in public spaces. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that, that you're so surprised that the... I'm, I don't know what you mean about a short history. I mean, if we're talking about the, you know, the advent of, of Kandinsky, Mondrian, uh, right up through to uh, Pollock and Newman, um, in terms of abstract art, I think there's been an ongoing tradition. I think what's abstract about art is the fact that flat plane in terms of painting is an illusion. I think when you finally get to Rodin, uh, Balzac has nothing to do with figuration, and when you get to the better Giacometti's, they have nothing to do with depiction. Uh, I'm not a weather vane in terms of uh, how much history you have to have backlog to make something um, interesting, but I would say that we've at least got a century in. And if I look at early uh, Donatello and uh, Michelangelo in terms of architecture, and Corbusier said it. He said the interesting thing about the Sistine Chapel is it actually destroys the wall. And I think that's the function of most work in terms of uh, public spaces, to um, render the architecture uh, transparent, not to augment the architecture, not to put on the new embellishment. And I think that's probably one of the great um, problems right now is that people who are working outside really have to deal with the fact that the power is in the hands of the architects. And what the architects will not have is someone redesigning the content of the space and place in which they've set their buildings. And what they really want is decor. And if a sculptor um, builds a piece that changes their basic notion of construction, then um, it's very, very difficult for that work to survive. So what you have is most grants going to those people which will continue to um, use art under the guise of implied art or applied art. And the applied arts, I actually think, have a purpose. You know, they, they might as well just decorate the banks with them. It doesn't bother me. But I think when you um, don't make distinctions between intentions, then we really get into trouble. And I actually think things like Portlandia, uh, the seal that Graves put on the front of his building uh, out there is um, really a throwback. And I think that uh, Contraposto bronze figures on tops of buildings are throwbacks. And it's interesting in this century, you know, you haven't had too many abstract movements, probably don't even have one abstract painter or sculptor in France since the Second World War. And in this country, you had probably the um, greatest effort with the abstract expressionists and sculptors that were around that group. Since then, the country has been in a mannerist heyday. And right now I see 
the new um, appreciation of Europe uh, dovetailing back into tradition. And it's sad. I find it very sad. Mm. Sad in that I think that you only really have the historical figures that you choose and the models that you choose. And I find that the commercial scene has actually um, altered uh, the um, knowledge and invention by um, equating value with what I would call mediocre work. And there's a lot of that going down. And, you know, I have no reason to put the people down who are involved with it. People do what they do and they do the best they can do. It's just that I find that when abstract art starts to um, be demeaned as, quote, formalistic and without content, then people should really ask themselves, what is content and what is meaning? And why is it that something that really is um, involved with its own internal structure and its own internal necessities um, can't also have the same kind of content as anything else that depicts or illustrates those things in the real world. In fact, I find the latter in its abstract notion to make a horse in bronze, to make a tree in bronze, to make a house in bronze, to make a waterfall in bronze, totally, totally without plausibility at the end of the century. Well, I mean, when they're making a uh, equestrian monument, they're honoring someone the society esteems. When they're making a, uh, 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 say, a tree in bronze, what they're doing is decorative elaboration. And what, what are you doing? You're, you're thrusting a, a kind of a, 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 something on the people. What, an idea, an intellectual idea about space, shape? I, I, think, I think you're getting close to it. We're not memorializing. We're not politicizing. We're not setting things separate on, a, on pedestals that we have to worship. We are dealing with the nature of space and the nature of sculpture and the nation of, nature of a given site. I think you're getting close. I think you're even actually starting to see it might be something other than those other things. And the, for sure, there's a history of it, and the history of it is very strong. And I think it, it absolutely needs to survive, and uh, I think it needs to be built. And I think it needs to be built with a lot of uh, forthright courage, because right now, um, the way marketing goes is no one buys the product. They buy who buys the product. So you put 10 cents into the uh, perfume bottle, a dollar on the packaging, and $10 on the advertisement. You have uh, football players selling light beer. I mean, it's fairly interesting, because I just had, well, I won't even go through it, but it's fairly interesting how sales and marketing affects people's taste in this country. And what I would say is that there's no taste and no appreciation, nor has there ever been in this country, for two things, or maybe three. Experimental film, poetry, and sculpture. There's absolutely no audience for it, and there never will be. And maybe that's what keeps it marginal and keeps it lively. What, what did you think of the uh, architecture of Federal Plaza? Horrendous. Horrendous. Did, did, did you seek out that commission, or did that just come your way? Or uh, how, how does something like that happen? It's called General Services Administration. One sculptor gets to build one piece of sculpture with one federal building once in his life. And the painter gets to paint one painting and put it in those buildings once in his life. And most of them have gone down with a great deal of criticism. And um, if you ask the people in the building who seem to know a lot about sculpture, if they've ever been to uh, the modern, you would find out no. And if you, find, if you ask them their nature of sculpture, we would probably have either Martin Luther King out there on a pedestal or given the politics of the time, General Douglas MacArthur or, you know, maybe George Steinbrenner, depending where the Yankees are. But their notion of sculpture and my needs are absolutely um, in contradiction. And it's absolutely my belief in that the nature of my work um, will reach the audience that needs to know what it's about. And I think that that audience is very, very minuscule. If you think that it's elitist and egotistical of, for me to build it in those places, I was asked to um, submit for the uh, commission, and it took about three years for the piece to be verified, and we probably had to go through 14 juries, and we had to change 12 um, assumptions about what we were doing in order to satisfy all of their codes. Um, other than that, all I can say is that the panel that selected me and actually juried the work was a panel of experts. And here's where you get into a big problem. <clears throat> if we don't basic problems is just that that 
um, politicians who deem it liberal to um, get behind art often find themselves in the dilemma of dealing with abstract art because it's useless. And what I mean by useless is that it returns its content to itself. And in returning its concept, its content to itself and not allowing people to augment their notions of the realities of the status quo, it acts as an unwanted object in a place of um, public domain. And when that happens, um, politicians feel that the contradiction therein uh, needs to be uh, rectified. So consequently, what you have is Regan cutting the national budget, the NEA. Now, the NEA represents one six hundredth of one percent of all the money that this country spends, less than one jet airplane. And yet you get a lot of uh, points for cutting the national budget. When you do that in rela relation to the GSA, what happens is Oldenburg's, D'Souvro's, Calder's, Noguchi's, Morris's, Judd's, Heiser's, that kind of work is not going to be built in the future. And then what happens when you cut the NEA and you dismiss the GSA is it's really turned back over to the galleries. So the notion of the gallery and its container means flat wall, flat space, and who does it go to? It goes to an elite that can collect it and then, given the consortium, um, contribute it with an income tax incentive to a museum, and the profit returns to them, and uh, the situation is um, enlarged. Now, one of the only alternatives that American sculptors have had is to be able to deal with the fact that this country and its open policy toward building sculpture and allowing paintings to exist here and there was one of the ways that sculptors could survive outside of the commercialism of the scene. That has been taken away in the 80s in both the NEA and the GSA. And you'll find critics applauding the fact that it's turned away and actually augmenting the uh, gallery dealers and the newspapers because that's who they serve. That's who butters their bread. I mean, you're not going to find magazines cover covering work outside because no one's paying for the ad inside. So uh, wh why do you work so large? I mean, is, is your... I think, that's, I think scale's really a um, problem of context. And in some contexts, I work small, and some I work large. I don't think scale has to do with uh, size. I think it has to do with internal relationships in relation to context. I'm not interested in putting pieces in large places where they look like Easter egg hunts. I take a great deal of um, consideration and the need to uh, build my pieces commensurate with the scale of the context. So I don't feel the pieces are, quote, large. I mean, I use very standard size material that anyone can get in any uh, steel mill. Because I've had sort of this image of you finding yourself in public spaces because of your urge to work large. No, that. no, how, no. How how did you find yourself in these public spaces? And it, really, I mean, I think because at one point I realized that I wanted to follow my work and the contradictions in it, both internally and externally, from its inception to its conclusion, and that if you're making work and it goes from your studio via a box to a dealer to a museum to another dealer to a collector, um, where it exists in context and how it's changed you can no longer deal with. You have to relinquish any responsibility. And I wanted to somehow um, avoid that situation. I would rather just build pieces in place so that they um, could not be open to secondary sale. That's not always possible. There's not always a support system. There's not always a context for that. But it, it, I think that it became quite apparent to me early on that uh, the responsibility of my work really started with the idea and ended with the placement. And if I could control all of those contradictions right straight through, at least I felt a little more justified in the consequence of my work than if I would just give it to a dealer and let him sell it to whoever, and it would appear wherever, next to whatever, under whatever light, and, um, you know, gracing the um, backyards or rooms of whatever clientele. So, so you found yourself in public spaces because you wanted to control the, 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 the space. You, you wanted it to be a permanent piece. Not the space so much. I think I wanted to control my responsibility to my work from its inception to its completion. Yeah. Now, what happens if the building next to it was changed? I mean, then the context of your piece has changed. Look, uh, 
Certainly. And what happens if, and when you say what happens if, we get into what you call contrary to fact conditional predicated on if. What happens if the floor falls in right now? I really don't know if this tape will get finished if we go on that way. No. Okay. What, what, hap- what about uh, the reality of the graffiti on your piece? That's the reality. And how, how do you feel about that? I think they usually do it for six months and they find something better to do. I don't mind it um, at all. I, it, I mind it when it becomes very, very personal. But if people are going to graffiti, that's um, a definite reaction they're having to it. I mean, I mean, I think absolutely work is more consequential probably if it does make demands on people. People really do have to change their notions of what's in their environment. Um, so I don't find that, the graffiti particularly hostile. I find it only hostile when it's directed toward me. But graffiti in itself I don't find hostile. Wait, but you just said that what did that? I don't think it changes the character of my work, to tell you the truth. Not really. I think it's pretty hard to change the character of my work. I, I don't think um, graffiti does it. You know, think graffiti looks like you know, so much lame decoration. Uh, you, you just said that uh, you you think that it, it's good for the work to challenge people's uh, uh, attitudes towards the environment around them. Sure, absolutely. I think art, if it has any potential at all, really probably has the potential to declare itself as art. And I think once it does that, people have to run up against it. And I think it's interesting that um, you take a five-year-old kid and he says, Daddy, what's that? You say, sculpture, that he's born with that notion of sculpture in the world, in his environment. He won't have any problem with Alsworth Kelly. And, and so you think that that, you know, that piece you, you feel ideally is educating people? And I never really think the intent of any of the work is to educate people. And, you know, sometimes you have this blind notion that there's this seepage going on. I sat at UCLA where there's the four uh, Matisse backs started in 1909. I think we were finished in 27 or 28. And they're in the Modern Museum. People go to the Modern Museum under that moral, you know, umbrella. They'll sit and take photographs and, uh, you know, go on in reveries about the nature of the work. And yet you'll have 5,000 people um, at every class break passing right in front of the same sculpture without so much as a discernment. So I think a lot of why people look at art has something to do with their f- putting, keeping their finger in the cultural pie. And the same people who profess to have an interest when it's in the museum or the enclosed elite morality will actually be horrified once it's out in the public space. And I think you just have to ask yourself about the nature of those people's um, allegiances and really who they do serve and really who they do answer to. Because... Um, I think most critics in this city are really full of shit, right down the line. Well, what is your, is your art, uh, is it about aesthetics or is it about ideas? I, 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 for instance, though... I think you can figure that out. I mean, that's not for me to define. I mean, if I start explaining it, I'll explain it away. I think the work is there to be understood, and I think the people who have knowledge to understand it, understand it. I think those who don't might learn, although I don't think it teaches anything. Yeah, well, this, let's take the material out of which it's made. Like, a lot of people think that that's, it's, it's ugly material. They, they think it's ugly. Yeah. Now, do you, I mean, is in, in putting this in a public space, do you think that they're going to learn to appreciate that material? I think the notion of people um, finding one material ugly or another material non-ugly really has to do with um, corporate media indoctrination. You know, it used to be plastics, and then it was stainless steel, and now it's bronze. And uh, steel kind of gets the bum rap. Probably another 25 years, once core tent goes out, and they're not building in that product anymore, it's going to look like wrought iron. And everybody has a great reverence in this city for the wrought iron buildings. I think it's um, that the taste is really not um, equated with an individual's knowledge of the material, but it's um, more equated with one's indoctrination about bad steel, good bronze, you know, good marble, bad wood. I mean, all of those things I find laughable. No, no I, I can't, I, have, I, I, I can't agree yeah. with that. I mean, you have something, you have certain constants, like gold's always been valued. Okay, that's exactly what we're talking about. Gold's been valued, right? And those are the, I think if we built a gold curve out there, people would like it all for the wrong reasons. And I just went to see the Rodin show, and I saw the, news ca- the new cast of the Rodins, and it's all for the wrong reasons. And if you're interested in equating sculpture with material value, then you might as well, you know, look to uh, the pe- look to the people who do that, and look to the um, 
the surface of the ideas that are being um, perpetrated. And you tell me if that has anything to do with sculpture or consumption, because that's what you really do find at Caesar's Palace out there in the uh, fountain. You know, that kind of work will always go down, and it'll always intimidate. Oh, gold, power, wealth, art. Yeah, but it, it goes beyond that. It goes, it, really? gold, gold is warm, and steel is cold. Oh. I mean, you know, gold, uh, there's something seductive about the gold. Well, at the steel, it obviously, uh, it, people, people are... Uh, All the better for steel. All the better for steel. Those aren't my uh, analogies or my metaphors. Those are yours. But if gold is warm and steel is cold, all the better for steel. All the better for the abstraction of the steel to take you to the um, conceptual referent and the idea that's being brought to bear where finally the material could evaporate and you take the idea home. Because once you leave a work of art, it grows in your mind and you have an experience of it that you would hope would be at least commensurate with that experience when you went to look at it again, say Matisse's Red Room. And once you go back, you carry that knowledge with you, and that becomes your dialogue. The physical fact of the work doesn't become your dialogue. 